children have a lot of health challenges, especially in developing countries like ours. In fact, the high maternal mortality ratio globally is considered the greatest social injustice of our time. Our statistics is still very poor, and the rate at which we are going, we're not going to achieve the SDG 3, which is getting our maternal mortality rate to 70 per 100,000 life birth. There have been so many interventions over several years, and there seems to be very, very, very little change. Uh, so what are we going to do to get that big bank of change? So we are we're hopeful that uh, from this summit, uh, the white paper can be actually be used and presented to the incoming government so that it can begin to help them shape some of their policy uh, directions. We want to see the reduction in terms of maternal, newborn and child diseases as well as death from these diseases. But actually now Nigeria contributes the highest numbers of women die. Uh, it's now estimated that about 82,000 women die yearly in Nigeria. Uh, we are going to recommend ways to reduce maternal mobility and mortality as well as finding solutions to the humanitarian challenges. When you have a healthy mother and then a healthy child, then the whole family tends to be happy. To work together. Uh, we have to have collective action uh, so that we all tackle the same problem together. Uh, maternal health and newborn health is all the same. All the actors of maternal health and newborn have to be speaking to each other. We have to be on the same table to address the problem. Globally, even the ending preventable maternal death and ending preventable newborn death are uh, collaborating together, are uh, partnering together, they have the same targets, they have the same milestones so that they can work together, align together, so that at the end of the day we can solve this problem of unacceptable or preventable maternal and child health. Uh, you know, I think a summit like this is really important to bring together all of the different stakeholders and put them together in one room. So, you know, I'm a researcher, I'm an academic, and often we tend to talk to ourselves. And the people in government, the policy makers, tend to talk to themselves. And I think, you know, a summit like this where you can bring, uh, you know, academics, you can bring policy makers from government, you can bring representatives from civil society to address what we all know is a big problem, I think is really important. Uh, we know that um, the private sector has not actively been engaged uh, in the healthcare sector, especially when you look at mainstream issues like maternal, newborn child health. Um, but we've, we've had experiences from um, cases of Ebola, COVID recently, and even from malaria, and we've seen how the private sector have been mobilized. Uh, so us, one of the key things we are putting forward in this summit as Engender Health is to say, um, how can we begin to mobilize the private sector? How can we begin to conscientize the private sector to let them see that we need to have additional investments in the healthcare sector, and they need to begin to become key actors driving the healthcare sector to ensure that we're able to provide services to every woman, every child in the communities, no matter whether it's a health to reach community or no matter whatever constraints they may face in that community. So being an obstetrician and gynecologist, there are a lot of things that are happening, you know. We have a lot of delays in managing patients. First of all, patients don't come early and then when they come, they tend to come very late. So that late arrival, most of the times they come where you cannot be able to help them or to salvage the problem they tend to come with. So in such cases, when they arrive very late, we sort of provide little or even nothing to help them and we end up losing this patient. Yeah, it pleases me to say that we've achieved a lot from this summit because if you notice, we've been able to bring together a wide range of stakeholders and they work together and a lot of recommendations are emanating from this summit. If we go down to 1987, when the Safe Motherhood Initiative was launched in Nairobi, Kenya, Alan Rosenfeld from Columbia University, where he asked the question, where is M in MCH? In other words, we've been concentrating a lot on the child health, forgetting the mothers. 
another publication which is from our own dear country, from Amadou Bello University, Zaria, where Professor Kelsey Harrison reviewed about 22,000 consecutive uh, uh, deliveries in that institution, highlighted some of the problems responsible for maternal death in Nigeria. And then, of course, in 1987, because of those two publications, the rationale for Save Motherhood was based on three reasons. One, that globally, too many women were dying, you know, about half a million annually, and that 92.3% of those deaths are occurring in developing countries. Two, that it is possible to reduce these high mortality rates because we have the evidence. The developed countries have overcome that hurdle. I mean, today, maternal mortality ratio in uh, the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, is about just for 100,000 deliveries, whereas our own is about roughly, we say, 455 per 100,000 deliveries. It could be more than that. And then thirdly, the other third rationale for safe motherhood is that the life of women, half of the population of the world, is worth saving. Women should not be dying in the process of giving us life. in maternal mortality and newborn health, 2000 to 2020. That's the most current and it came out just a month ago. They're saying that we have actually had a reduction, about one third reduction in terms of the total number of death occurring. All right, between 23, 2000 figure and 2020. That's 20 years uh, data. It is now 287. You realize that in 2017 we had 289, now we have 287. So there is a reduction taking place. In terms of the rate, maternal mortality rates, all right, what we have right now is 2 to 3 per 100,000 life births, globally. 2 to 3 per 100,000 life births. This is also a reduction in about a third reduction in the 20 years that we'll be monitoring data. All right, between 2000 and 2020, all right? The ladies and gentlemen, that same figure is telling us that 800, 800 women are dying every single day from maternal causes, from pregnancy and delivery causes. 800, every two minutes, a woman dies of a maternal cause. Every two minutes, a woman dies of a pregnancy and a, 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 a delivery cost every two minutes. I've spoken for the last probably seven minutes. That means we lost like three to four women. In that same report, Nigeria has the highest number in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Nigeria has the highest number. We are here. You can see our figure, the very dark blue figure. That is where we are. The very dark blue thing. We contribute 28.5% of women dying globally. Globally. In the last couple of days, years, just five years ago, we contributed just 17%. India contributed 12%. Now India is contributing only 8.3%. What did India do that we can't do? In 2013, India was highest, followed by Nigeria. In 2017, we took over from India. We became the highest when we were 17. India was 12. Now we are 28. India is 8.5. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not leave the new boss behind. Because you see, if you want to have if you want to uh, improve the newborn health, you want to improve the, the statistics of the newborn, you have to improve the statistics of the maternal health. Because almost 80% of the problems of the newborn, you can tackle them in during the 
during the entire pandemic. A lot of the problems that the, the babies end up having, we could or we should be able to tackle them in pregnancy and delivery. And green are the countries that are fast growing in terms of achieving the SDG 3, in terms of reducing the newborn uh, uh, statistic, infant mortality. All right? We want it to be top 100,000 life births. We heard from the minister that it is about 39 per 100,000 life births. We want it to become 12 per 100,000 life births. And you can see Nigeria is uh, slight uh, yellow, which means Nigeria's reduction is, is less, is between 2 and 3 percent reduction in our, in our newborn statistics. While the green, they are getting from 10 to about 20 percent reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much. In a bit to harness relative strength of individual players, leverage additional new resources, minimize duplication, including fast tracking positive health outcomes for maternal, newborn, and child health. The ministry proposed the establishment of the Rampart Plus 10 program at the sub national level and the creation of the Department of Family Health in all the 36 states plus the FCT in the state ministries of health to facilitate the implementation of Rampart Plus 10 health intervention to bring about the reduction of maternal, newborn, and child health mortality. This was approved at the 63rd National Council of Health, which was held in Abuja last year in December. The high-risk pregnancies that constitute 25% of all pregnancies in Nigeria, that is, pregnancy below the age of 18, pregnancies that are too close together, you know, Child birth should be spaced every two and a half years. Pregnancies that are more than four, and then pregnancies at old age. Government must ensure that we implement in every state, in every community, task shifting policy. That is, we train, for example, community extension workers to do things that midwives can do. But what they need, refresher training, monitoring, and supportive supervision at all times to ensure that they are doing the correct thing. Fund resources for maternal and child aid to be mobilized from inside the country. Uh, we have enough manpower, we have enough resources to do it. I think we should own it. Uh, and I think we should encourage state governments to buy, have a buy-in and have political will to be able to implement what is recommended. Because we see that there is a poor follow-up even to capacity building, to training, to um, uh, advocacy, uh, there is no response is very poor. Uh, that, that is very important that we must have a way of eliciting response. When we give them some ideas, when we give innovations, the government should take it up in a sustainable way uh, to make it work for the country. If you deliver with somebody that doesn't even know the complication, doesn't know how to identify the complication, and then the complication will occur. And that's when, after the complication has occurred, then you now start struggling of how to now refer her to the next level. So deliver with a skill birth attendant. The next thing after delivery is that you must make sure after you deliver, you come back to the health system to make sure everything is okay and then to give you advice on how you can now space your children how you can now space and regain all the all the all, you, you regain your nutrition you regain your strength so that you'll be ready for the next pregnancy now that can only be done if you come for what we call postnatal care which means you have come after you've delivered you come and then you will now be given that care as far as nigeria is concerned from the figure that we had this morning 82,000 women are dying annually in Nigeria. This is very, very shameful. In a country that is endowed with natural resources and human capital, it is shameful. That means that about 220 women are dying every day, silently, in their home or in hospitals, and nobody is caring about them. If one aeroplane carrying 220 people every day crash in Nigeria. I know what the government of Nigeria will do. This uh, event is really timely because this is a period where we need to 
improve our the rates that's the number of death for both mothers and then the newborns because we know it's really on an alarming late, uh, rate so we need to improve this rate and then to help to ensure the world that we're really working and people are really aware and then so that we'll put a smile at the face of these mothers. Yeah, this mother's um, emergency preparedness for the vital care and um, only 5% of healthcare providers have uh, reasonable skill in the Atlantic Association. I know we're talking about skilled attendant, but whenever we say skilled bad attendant, we tend to forget that there needs to be somebody who is skilled at the Atlantic Association. Because the woman goes into pregnancy labor because she wants to have a viable baby, she wants to have food. You know, you don't want to give her bronze and associated with. So those who are there should be able to do the natural resuscitation. But currently only five percent of all healthcare workers, including nurses, have reasonable skills. Two weeks ago, somebody posted he took his wife to a mother and child hospital. She was in labor. He said he met just one doctor on duty and there were five women scheduled for cesarean section. His wife would be the sixth and he realized that if he had to wait, his wife would probably die. So he had to now go and look for money to take her to a private facility. And five women waiting for one doctor to section that he had already diagnosed the, 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 the needed to section. But how could one doctor do that? We need the NHIA. You know, to come into this thing, make every Nigerian be a contributor. And we have typical example of this in Kamsa. Since that program has started, after our contributory years here, we have seen a serious improvement, you know, in the level of medical care that's given to the people in Kamsa. It's only really fantastic. People can now take their family for antenatal care, they can go for delivery, they can have cesarean section with a minimal, minimal amount of money. I happened to have a health insurance, I think from Germany, and what I saw them doing in that place is that in the primary health facilities that are all there, uh, they encourage the doctors, uh, professional doctors, for them to have the clinics. Uh, nobody goes to the tertiary uh, facility, like let's say in Kano. Uh, nobody will go there because of the headache or any other minor ailment. Men in the various roles they play within the society, as policy makers, as parents, as community leaders, as husbands, need to pay priority attention to their families. They need to take good care of their women and children very well because neglecting the health problems of these two groups means that we are neglecting a large chunk of health problems within our communities because of their large population. And it is said that taking care of a woman is like taking care of the whole nation because taking good care of her has implication on the health of their children. Therefore, we need to pay priority attention to them as well as our children so that we can have a healthier society. This is one of the pictures mm -hmm. of a settlement in Kaborongala. This is in Damchi local government. This, I know very well, is in Pondiga. And this is the queue, and it's just at the outskirts of this is how they queue for water in the IDP camps. Women and children. Each family is entitled to just one keg of this water. The Boko Haram humanitarian crisis had, has led to over 37,500 deaths and 2.4 million people internally displaced with severe impacts in the BAY states. We call them the BAY states Borno, Adamawa, and Yobi. And in some of the parts of Gombe, predominantly leading to physical and food insecurity. The venomous effects of this conflict on maternal and child health has a broad expanse, such as lack of shelter, safe and sanitary facilities, food shortage, death of health care personnel, and reduced access to quality health services. Until you've been in these camps, 
I see families crowded in makeshift camps to understand what these people are going through physically, mentally, emotionally. And it is so unfair because some of these people were doing quite well before. Some of them were farmers, some of them were welders, some of them were doing quite well in their villages. They didn't have to beg for a living. They didn't have to, you know, depend on people for water. They didn't have to go and queue up, lining up for food in camps. They were doing quite well for themselves. They were employers of labor. But then suddenly, this insecurity happened, and then it created socioeconomic inequalities, such as maternal education, sanitary conditions, and family health. There is need for the Nigerian government to pay specific attention to this region in a timely manner. So, how has insecurity affected maternal and child health in Nigeria? Insecurity, banditry, kidnapping have negative concomitant impact in the Nigerian economy. Everybody knows that. And it has overwhelming negative effects on health resources and have worsened our health indices. Insurgents have left over 788 dilapidated health facilities in the northern region. We'll take Borno as a case study. In Meduguri, 48 health workers have been killed so far. Two, with 250 injured, the state has lost over 40% of its facilities, with only a third being functional. I said 248 out of 804 primary health care centers have been destroyed in Borno, Adenauer, and Yumi. 26 out of 38 secondary level facilities have equally been destroyed. A large number of traumatized women and unaccompanied children with no psychosocial support are present. Poor sanitation, contaminated water, rebuilding is a challenge, you understand? And then there is food and nutritional situation leading to a high rate of malnutrition among the Americans. The depleted healthcare force stands to be a major limitation to health service delivery, as most health workers are unwilling to take up roles or resume appointments. We are, we are dealing with Boko Haram, and then the people that are working in the NGOs that were supposed to help them, they also turn bad. Apparently, what they do there, what in it, they will sell the food tickets to the families. And because they, these people are running away from their village, they don't have anything to do. Then the women were, it's okay, take my child. So they will give up their 13, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old girl for the man to sleep with, and then you'll give you your food items. According to the United Nations, more than 1.6 million women and girls in Nigeria have experienced gender-based violence. Women and girls are often targeted by armed groups. The soldiers want to rape you. Boko Haram want to rape you. And then the people take you that you're supposed to be safe with in the camp are also taking advantage of you. It's such a sad, sad situation. So what are the criteria that define achievement of a durable solution? Because it's not just saying we have a solution. The solution should be long-term, safety, security, and freedom, and target safety, security, and freedom of movement. It should be an acceptable standard of living. You should not think just because these people are in rural areas, let's down the consequences and send them back to their village just like that. They should have access to employment and a means of livelihood. Some people have become, you understand, have destroyed their uh, means of livelihood. So they should, we should rebuild their housing and property. You should have access to documentation. You should have family being reunited participation in public matters, and access to effective remedies and justice. Today, everybody is rushing to receive repentant insurgents. We have over 90,000 repentant insurgents, and the number is increasing in hundreds and thousands every week. They are repenting, coming back to be reintegrated, to be sent back to their hometowns, when they do go back, what happens there? There is landmine waiting for them. Many people have gone back to start scavenging and repairing their farms only to be killed or maimed by landmines. So we created a landmine action program. We have so many orphans that need to be rehabilitated, not just in the interest of giving them food, you will not know the value of parenting as a primary source of acculturation until you see orphans that have lost their humanity. 
They don't know whether they're humans or animals. You need somebody to give them a direction. And this is where the direction has to come from. We want to say that the maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate, and the five mortality rates that we have are embarrassing. Sincerely, ranking us with Somalia and some of those countries is difficult to accept. Sincerely. And the perspective we want to point out to this summit is to also look at, apart from combating the diseases, in recent times, if you check, conflict has become a major source of maternal mortality. We all know that um, the Northeast um, region has some of the worst um, health indices and um, we remain committed um, to support all our actors and um, we're also um, grateful to be invited to this very important discussion. So some of these discussions today might catalyze, you know, interventions or actions or initiatives down the road. The organizers of this program should pay an advocacy to those who are in a position to implement, to put these things to become part of our policies and our laws. Part of basic health care provision from 1% of consolidated revenues that comes to the health, part of it should be cut and be given to this maternal and neonatal and child health program because I think they are the most vulnerable. They are more vulnerable than any other vulnerable groups that you think. Findings of researches we've been conducting over several years uh, have indicated that women and children, both groups are vulnerable. Women, are because of the rigors of child bearing, child caring, and child rearing, and the excess demand put on them by other social challenges in our environment. And children, because of the demand of growth and development, their need for nutrition and health care put them under disadvantage if they happen to belong to a family where they are not taken good care of, especially those living in areas that are being afflicted by uh, crisis. So this summit is helping to curtail all the diseases, especially preventable diseases, so that we would prevent death and as much reduce the maternal as well as the newborn uh, death rates in Nigeria. It's been very educative really. It's not easy to gather such caliber of uh, highly professional and skilled people to talk about a topic. What we heard from Professor Galadensi is that we have the worst figure. Can you please tell us some of these reasons why, especially in Nigeria, we've not been able to make a headway. Why we are not celebrating maternal mortality as we have celebrated polio some years back. Maternal mortality has been a major We've been discussing this for many years, as we said earlier on the Daddy Book. The people out there who are dying are not here. They don't know what is going on. All the discussion begins here and ends here. We have not reached the people up to now. We know why this woman died very clearly. It's because they don't deliver as assistance. It's because they start delivering to early. It's because they do it too many times and at a very short interval, and they go on to take ages to deliver. And of course, it's like crossing the road. If you walk, is to cross the road several times every day. You have a higher risk of being knocked out by a bullet vehicle. If we want to reduce maternal mortality, two things must happen, or three. One, we must move the women from their homes to facilities where they can deliver. And that's what we should. And those facilities must be properly equipped with necessary drugs, with necessary equipment, with the necessary well-trained providers. Don't let us underestimate the capacity of our people in this country. Our people are ready, ready to work. They just need direction. They need people to tell them what to do and how to do it. That is all they, look, they are looking for. But if we build it in such a way that the community buys in it and they are part and parcel of it, they will make it wrong. 
How can we be doing the same thing and thinking to get better results? We cannot do that. I believe that if we are to take Ghana health statistics, I think by now they are better than ours. So that we can have doctors in these rural areas. What my eyes have seen in pregnant women, in labor, sick children, brought from rural areas to us in the ivory towers to drink, what our eyes have seen is not what it should be seen. Please see, our resident doctors, after primary, let us organize, we go to the rural area, and you know they will be very serious there, and they will walk. And let me tell you, in the next 10 years, all these statistics will change. At least we have a purposeful, coordinated, and sustained program. Within this, we'll keep on coming to conference summit like this and discuss it. It will now become just like a tell. We come and tell ourselves what you don't know, you will know. But the action uh, is not there. So now if you look at the Nigerian health system, it's so fragile because it is where it is placed where in concurrent lists. I think this is the first major problem. It's in concurrent lists. Had it been it is in the exclusive lists, it would have been better. For this summit, those of us in administration look up to the university community with a lot of expectations. First of all, it's not every time that we have the opportunity of getting data assembled in one room, like in conferences and summits. Therefore, this summit is so significant to all of us. Our appreciation therefore goes to the Center for Infectious Disease Research, an African Center for Excellence, uh, of Excellence for Population Health and Policy of the Bayero University Kano for organizing this timely summit. We are very aggressive working with the Ministry of Health in the area of improving the prevention of mother to child uh, transmission, PMTCT, which is uh, a bony issue in the spectrum of uh, maternal and child health. We are very happy to be part of this summit. So this summit, is of particular interest to us. As medical women, we believe, just like all health workers in Nigeria, that no woman should die giving birth. And no child <coughs> that is brought into the world should die from preventable deaths. The government, of course, has a huge role to play. Um, but specifically for this summit, I think what we want from policy actors, policy makers, government is to listen uh, and to talk back uh, so that there is a two-way conversation and hopefully make progress. The most important thing is that the issue of maternal newborn health must be in the agenda. It must come top priority in the agenda. Yes, health is important, transportation is important, every other security is important, but also the health of our women and children is important. It has to be on the agenda because we know what, what causes death of our women. We know what it causes death of our newborn and our children. And we know the solution, but the problem is that we have to ensure that their lives is important, that we have to save their life. The final solution, there must be political commitment. There's no reason why women should be dying during the process of giving us life. They are performing an important function. We can continue to talk about these issues and how we can address them, but we must have political will. The political will has to be there. Funding has to improve. Any adequate funding for maternal health, neonatal health, or child health should be judiciously utilized by the ministries of health, both federal and sub-national level, 
There is no reason why this ministry should be returning money to the Treasury at the end of every fiscal year. Uh, we need to make our health system sustainable. We need to, we need to strengthen our health system. We, we must make sure that there is enough commodities, drugs and equipment uh, in our health facilities. We need to train more people, in particular midwives, so that we can ensure that mothers have been delivered by skilled birth attendants. And we need to be generating data for action because we need to take our decisions based on uh, data that we generate. We need to improve the health literacy of our people so that they will understand that pregnancy, as simple as it appears to be, can be complicated. Therefore, we must increase hospital utilization, not just for antenatal visits, but also for deliveries and postnatal care. If we are unable to really look at the issue in its entirety uh, as a comprehensive, in a comprehensive no. manner, but where is this one coming from? Has she been had a few cheats? When was the last time she met? We hear this in our stories. The nuances come out to me. We don't really pay attention to those drivers that actually cause the woman not to come to the vaccination. To ensure that we increase antenatal visits, hospital deliveries by skilled birth attendants to be above 80%. I will recommend to the government of Nigeria to make sure that these services are free for pregnant mothers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.